Hey everybody, I'm Chip Foose and I'm here in my, shall we say, our uh, showroom at Foose Design. And you know, I get asked all the time, what's your favorite car you've ever built? And to be honest with you, I don't have an answer to that. Every one of them is like one of my kids. But if you were to ask me what car best exemplifies the capabilities of the crew at Foose Design, that would be Ken and Leela Reister's impression sitting here in the showroom with me right now. Now this car started in 1999 when I was at the Detroit Auto Show and I met up with Ken Reister and we were at a restaurant called Fishbones and when Ken told me that he wanted something like the Smoothster I did a real quick napkin sketch of what I thought that should be. He fell in love with it here we have the car. From that drawing I actually did more detailed drawings ended up doing dimensional drawings we did a quarter scale model working with Tim Fitzpatrick once the model was done, we pulled a mold and we actually built a fiberglass quarter scale model of the car. And then we built a second one that we put back on the platform and we laid sections out on it, actually cut the model and then transferred those sections onto flat paper, blew that up 400% and we built a wooden buck. We took the wooden buck and the chassis out to Marcel's and Marcel and Luke, they actually built the body for us installed it onto the chassis. We brought that back to the shop and did our subtle modifications to the chassis before we started doing all the detail work. It's not just the body. Even though this did not start from an original car, it's based off a of 36 Ford, but it's all the little details where I wanted it to be extremely exotic and uh, shall we say sophisticated and elegant. And the other thing I don't want to do is design something that's going to smack you in the face with a real bright color I want the color to be as subtle and elegant as the design itself. We finished the car in 2005, took it to Detroit and won the Riddler Award at the Autorama there. When I design a car, I like to come up with several themes that will carry throughout the car. What I want is if you were to walk through the shop and see one part on one bench, go in another part of the shop and find another part, you would think that that looks like it belongs to the other part because there's a theme throughout. And everything on this car, the theme was a soft-sided triangle. And it was if you took a section through the front fenders, that section of the fender has that soft radius on each side of, the, of that triangle. And I carried that through on every single part that we could possibly build on the car. The spokes on the wheels, the hinges underneath the hood, the V8 in the headlights. When you look at the headlights, what I wanted was the V8 logo in the headlight itself. Rather than one giant round bulb, I chose to go with two smaller Pia lights, stacking the second one behind and actually lower than the top of the upper head or front headlight. So it creates that figure eight. But then using that same soft sided triangle, created two bars and we clay modeled the parabola, which is all the surface around each of the light and going through here from the lens over to the other side that houses the two lights and the V8 logo in there. And uh, I think this is one of the really cool details of the car that, you know, I just fell in love with when we figured that one out. Now, working with the legendary Dan Fink, we created the grill in this car, which is all stainless steel, completely hand shaped. Uh, Carl here at the shop machined all the surface of the, uh, the bars, the radiuses. And also, if you look at the center bar, it goes from three quarters of an inch down to, uh, I think it's a quarter inch at the bottom, and there's a peak in that. That was all machined flat, polished, and then radiused. All of these are radiused after they were polished, polished again before they're welded together. But it's this little bar right here that goes all the way around. It's two pieces welded in the center. Those are a half inch to an inch and a half at the bottom, radiused in the front, and then completely hand shaped to fit the opening. And then all the bars tacked and welded inside and then repolished afterwards. This is a piece of artwork in itself. And without Dan Fink, who knows what it would have looked like. When you open the hood on the impression, what I wanted was something to look like a modern Ford flathead. It's an LS1 motor, but we've covered everything up and used those coil packs brought the wires out where normally these holes on top of the heads on a flathead would have the spark plug. 
we ran the wires through them, but they're actually coming the other way. They're going from a coil pack around and going down to the plugs in the side of the motor. Now there are covers completely all over the side of this motor in the front of this motor. So it's disguised. You can't tell that it's an LS1 motor. It looks like a modern flathead. The uh, intake has all these soft little black, looks like black chrome pieces. The very last one is handmade and it's covering all of the wires going through the firewall. What I wanted here was this is actually a ram air system. The tubes are hollow. It's picking up air in front of the radiator, pulling back and dropping through into that plenum. Now, if you pull these back, you can actually pull the tubes off and one side goes to the oil fill. The other side is going to, uh, actually it pulls off from the front to the water fill for the radiator. Even the plenum itself, when the air comes in through this ram air system and drops into the plenum before it feeds the motor itself, that little piece, sometimes you never know what's gonna inspire a shape or a form in the pieces that you're making. Well, if you're familiar with a south wind heater, that's what this is. I've got one sitting here. You can see that shape turned over this way. That's exactly what we used to make that plenum. When it comes to the design of the wheel, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Now in the 1930s, Ford made a wheel that was just like this on almost all of their cars. If you look at the hub shape, it's taller in the back and drops down to the front. The spokes go from the front of the hub to the back of the wheel. And then this rear spoke goes from the back of the hub to the front of the wheel. It's the same thing. That also had a V8 hubcap, which we run the V8 hubcap, but the hub is taller in the back, dropping front and forward. The front spoke is going to the back of the wheel and the back of the wheel is going to the front of the wheel. It's the same thing, just carried through. Just like I wanted a modern day flathead, this is a modern day 30s Ford wheel that you would have find on the car. Done in billet with a soft sided triangle. We finished the wheels, but you have to wrap those with some tires. And at the time I was working with BF Goodrich and they actually produced a smooth tire in the mold. I designed a tread based off of the V8 logo and from the V8 logo, the tread pattern grew from that. They hand cut all four tires on the car and that's where we went to the show and they're still on the car today, 15 years later. If you look at the way that all of the chrome trim fits around the car, all of this has to be blocked and fit to the windshield frame. The windshield frame is completely handmade out of eighth inch plate, working with uh, Dave Willie who ended up building that part. Uh, all of these are hand shaped, cut out, welded together. We take it to the uh, chrome shop. They would copper dip that, bring it back to us. We would block sand it on the car, making sure that it fit the cowl, that all the pieces fit. Make sure that, you know, using that copper, you actually sand that as if it's a primer or a Bondo. I think we copper dipped this windshield frame about 24 different times. Also having to make sure that it's small and lining up with the tops of the door molding around the back, the top itself, the molding coming around there. If you notice the split here in the, in the molding on the top lines up with the little peak line that's in the windshield frame itself. There's also a back split and that line is exactly on line with the center of the French seam, which rolls around the top. Now, normally this seam would drop down and line up with something here, which was my first intent. And when I asked Jim if we could run that all the way around the top, he said, that's a lot of wasted material. And I don't know if I can get the center to fit without putting a seam in it. I said, let's run the seam and put the V8 in the middle. We were able to achieve that. But once again, working with Jim was a dream because I can come up with ideas and he'll figure out how to do it. You know, the only three pieces that we bought on this car are an LS engine. We bought a uh, 700 R4 transmission and we bought a Corvette center section as the rear end. So all match GM parts. But when you look at them, you don't know what they are because they've all been modified. Every single piece on this car is considered a piece of art. And while we were building it, I said to everybody building their part, think of that part as if it's going to sit in the middle of the hood and that's going to be the piece that gets judged to win or lose the show. So every single piece has been treated with that type of care. As much work that was done on the outside, there's just as much work on the bottom because when you're competing for a show like the Riddler, 
or America's Most Beautiful Roadster, every single piece has to be judged and looked at. And there is as much time finishing the bottom of this car as all of the top. Charlie Hutton worked with us and uh, Glazerit Paint. And we finished this car inside and out. And what's amazing is how beautiful this car looks today. And it's uh, almost 15 years old. One of the other themes in this car is, as we we're building it, I told all the guys, now I don't want anywhere on this car to have one piece bolt on top of another piece. If we're gonna do that, I want the bottom piece to be puzzle pieced so the top piece fits right in it and there's just a gap. So nowhere on this car, if you walk around and look for it, will you find a piece bolted to the top of another piece. If we had to, we machined a piece out of a thicker material, cut the shape of the new piece into it, drilled and tapped the holes, that piece was welded into that other part, and then the new piece was fit in. So everywhere on this car that there's a gap, it's treated like the hood to the door, the cowl to the door. Uh, everything is flush fit, and then it transfers into another shape, so all the reflections flow. The back window is a soft-sided triangle, both two pieces with a split in the middle. The mirror itself is the same shape, and if you grab the mirror and turn it counterclockwise, it releases the threads on the bar. You can drop the mirror where you want it, turn it tight again. Uh, just a neat little detail that I wanted in the car. Uh, every piece of chrome on this car was hand-shaped, filed, and fit to the car itself, but they followed that same soft-sided triangle, which is the theme throughout the car. As I sit in this car, I, I discover things that I've even forgotten about. And even the throttle and the brake arms coming out from underneath the dash are that same soft-sided triangle. The column drop itself is made to look like the fenders as well. Uh, even the horn ring is that shape coming straight off of each of the spokes as you look straight into it. Everything is tied straight in and across and, and lined up. Two pieces that are completely wrapped around as the dash undercover, as the kick panels themselves rolling down as the firewall uh, covers up right all the way to the carpet. I mean, just really beautiful, subtle little details. When you look at the top, I wanted the top to look like a folding top with the bows that are in here, but it doesn't actually fold. It's just lift off. And as you look inside, you can actually see the chrome strip that's attached to the body, which is what the top sits on. The top doesn't sit on the paint. It doesn't rub the paint. When you pull it off, it's gonna be beautiful and it's not gonna look like what normally goes here. Why is the paint all rubbed away? That doesn't happen when you finish it like this. Such fun to look at all the details. The chrome strip, that same soft-sided triangle that rolls around from fat and getting thinner as it goes all the way to, through the doors, but then transferring into the handle so you can pull the door closed without getting your fingerprints on the paint itself. Just fun little details. It's fun to look at the different textures that are in here. Matte finishes, gloss finishes. Now the gauges were originally 1935 Chevrolet but we redid the colors to match this car and then painted the gate, the needles to match the car. Redline gauges, Shannon over there, he put all modern uh, gauges inside of that old looking face. You know, when I laid out the dash, like I say, I always try to figure out a theme of what's gonna look good, what's gonna be the layout. And what I came up with was, this is the large, what I would call the fuselage of an airplane. These are where the motors and the props would be. These are the wings coming out from it. And then this would be the landing gear. One side is the headlights. The other side is actually the key that pushes in. Now we hand turned all of these. That was Carl when he was working here at the shop. He hand turned and made all those knobs, which as you look throughout the car, every knob on the car matches and is identical. Even the little knob on the center console, when you pull it up, that matches the same as every knob in the car. You pull this up and you've actually got your air conditioning, your seat heaters, the Clarion stereo that's uh, powering the ARC audio amps and speakers throughout the car. Now, if I want to get into the trunk of the car, pull the seats forward, open this little door. There's actually a master power switch here, but with pulling the levers here, one releases the top, one releases the trunk. But now I can go back and open the trunk. When you first look in the trunk, you notice the soft shape of the floor and the soft-sided triangle chrome moldings that are sitting there. But also, 
if you were to open that front panel, you can get the power source so you can now always have a trickle battery charger hooked up. It's just a, an extension cord that's up in there that you can pull out and run out and keep it charged. Now the other thing you'll see is this real smooth deck lid cover. And there's two little rubber stops that come down and sit on the paint. Well, if you were to pull the rubber stop off, those are two screws that when you release those screws, you can pull this whole trunk off. That'll expose the bolts that are holding the hinges on. But over here is a little door also that when you turn that little lever and open it up, this is where you fill it up with the gas. Now in Detroit, you're, ha you're supposed to have a locking gas cap. That's why we have a locking gas cap in there. Not that we're afraid anybody's gonna steal the gas. <laughs> now the rear bumper and taillights are one of my favorite details on this car. You remember back in the 60s, they had the little, uh, uh, they almost looked like a spaceship that had a top on it that you would grab and you would push it and it would spin it and the little lights would come on and it was just this crazy little spaceship toy for kids. That's what the lights remind me of. And the reason for that is the parabola inside is a machine dome with holes drilled all the way around it for the LEDs. Then there's a red lens that's floating right in front of that, a flat red lens, and then a chrome bullet that's that same soft-sided triangle that's machined and floating in the middle of that red lens. Then a clear lens that's floating in front of that, which is giving you that same it reminds me of that little spaceship when I was a kid. I remember having one of those and playing with it, but it's where if I could grab that ball and pull it up and push it down, it would spin that little uh, spaceship looking thing. And that's what the lights remind me of. Now these are sitting out here and they almost look like they're a part of the body. But if you look at the bumper, which this is all shaped out of eighth inch plate, each piece is bent, shaped, welded together, filed, and then copper plated many, many times and blocked and then chrome. But this is actually the only place that's attached is in the front. These little Nerf bars are a part of that. The license plate is bent and bolted from underneath. This whole thing gets bolted onto the car. But the cool thing is these lights are actually floating. You can put that rag all the way around. That's the only place that's attached. That's a floating light. It's the spaceships on the rear of the car. You know, it's one thing to build a hot rod. It's another thing to build a car to compete for an award like the Riddler Award at the Detroit Autorama. And Impression was built for that purpose. And it's the bottom of the car. When you're building a hot rod just to go drive and enjoy, you really don't care about the bottom and how well it's detailed. But this, there is more work in the bottom of this car than all of the top. As difficult as it was to hand build the body and do all the details, the same detail is treated to every single part in the bottom of this car. And starting with the whole idea of not wanting to have one piece bolted to another piece, unless the first piece is cut and puzzle pieced for the second piece, so that every gap is flush fit, just like a door gap or a hood gap on a car. The surfaces are the same and there's just a gap. So you can follow that through on all of the sheet metal, the way that it fits from the body to the fender or the fender to the running board, the way that the running boards and the fenders fit to the, to the body itself, the way that we have these little access panels that are all fit to the car itself, uh, even the differential and hiding all of the bolts that were there. We've got pieces that cover that. We've got an exhaust system, the tip that fits into that. Uh, 
And as I've said before, the soft-sided triangle, every tube or bar that we could actually put that into, we did that and it blends from the soft-sided triangle back to a circle where it's going in and being functional. It's hard to even know where to start, but even all of the tubes as they came in, you know, just tube to a tube being welded, rather than it just being a hard angle or a weld, we took U-bends, cut those sections out, and there's four U-bends on every one of these joints back over here. And then instead of the tube just going up and being square to the floor, we made these collars that they dropped onto the frame, we bolted the body onto the frame, and then we siliconed those to the bottom of the frame itself, or the bottom of the body. And it's all those little details that each piece is painted, polished, finished, before it's assembled, so that once we're in the show, like the, auto, the Detroit Autorama, there's nothing that can be knocked or you know, lose points for, because every single piece is addressed. As you get up into the front of the frame, that same soft-sided triangle is a part of the frame itself. We've got two sections, a cross member. Now the motor mounts, rather than it being, do we do it motor color or do we do it chassis color? We use the motor mount as a separate piece that has both colors with a pinstripe surrounding it. So you don't have an odd color break. It actually blends together. Even the oil pan on the transmission, we didn't want to see the side of it where you actually normally will see the gasket and the fit of the oil pan to the transmission. We scanned the original tranny pan and then designed a new lip that covers up the side of the transmission. And on the top, it's got that same thing. It's flush and it's just like a door gap. We didn't want to be able to see that it's an LS1 motor. So we built these covers, everything is hidden. So you can't tell what the motor is. You look at the uh, exhaust tubes, they're all black chromed. And then as it goes up into the flange itself, that's polished stainless. Well, that was packed with a heat absorbing compound as it was welded, so it wouldn't discolor. Even the shaft for the steering, you look at that, it's not like just a, a regular U-joint. Uh, Everything is smooth and clean and polished and finished. You can see where the U-joint is here, but it was all welded and made into look like one piece. Going into the front, you can see all the covers, the little details, even the Pulleys have covers on the front of them. Everything is machined to match the same as the, uh, all the knobs on the interior. That same detail is on all of the front of the pulleys. It's just fun little details. You look at the A-arms. Now, the geometry of the A-arm is a C4 Corvette, but we redesigned it, cut those out of billet. I didn't want to see a nut and bolt holding the shocks on, so there's a little detail here that you can see. We made a tool that spins that off and once that comes off, there's an Allen bolt that goes in there and we can pull the Allen bolt to get the shock out. Now we also didn't want to see all the threads on the bottom of the shocks when you adjust it. So once we adjusted the shocks, then we made these collars that cover all those threads. It's the little details like that that make a huge difference when you're at a show. When you look at the exhaust itself, we've got these hangers that are coming from the floor. Now actually inside underneath that hanger is the section where we're split from one part to the other. Now, it also has a hole in it, so they slide together, but they're also timed, so this won't spin because it's, it's got a round notch that goes into that hanger, and they're slid together, and then the tubes themselves are sliding one within the other, and there's silicone O-rings, high temperature silicone O-rings. They're stopping anything from leaking, sound, or any condensation that's built up in that exhaust. Everything's gotta go out the back, but it's all fit. You don't see any bolts finished on that. Uh, Finished inside, outside, you look at the way that the uh, tranny mount is fit into here. Those little covers will come out. They'll expose the bolts. You can pull that out, drop it down. Now there's a tranny cooler, but you don't want to just look up at a tranny cooler. So we made a complete housing over that, finished it, but you can't see how it's even bolted in. All the bolts are hidden and they're on the top. Well, I hope you enjoyed the tour around impression. And it reminds me of something my father taught me. He said, you're only as good as your customer allows you to be. Ken and Leela Reister, you're the best. Thank you.